concern is that you might have Good morning. You guys are uh, ready to start whenever you'd like. Um, you can take your time. We had a couple more minutes for people to shuffle in. Um, or we can get started whenever you're ready. Let's do two more minutes. Just give people some time. Sure. Give just a minute or two for people to join. Also, notice there's fewer questions at 7 a.m. too. <laughs> Just, it's kind of quiet. Very quiet. <laughs> share my screen and start. The numbers seem oh, slightly stable. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CADWAG 2021, our virtual conference. This is session SIM09, titled APIs in Biodiversity Informatics, Innovations and Opportunities. I am Noreen Spears. One of a team of moderators, including Ben Norton and Ian Engelbrecht. I want to start by thanking the University of Florida conference team for their tech support, especially Katie McWilkinson, who's joining us this morning. And thank you also to each of you for joining this session. And of course, to our presenters. Oh, and this morning we have six presenters during this session, each lasting between 10 and 15 minutes. And we'll have some time for live questions afterwards for about three minutes. If you have a question, please submit it in the WOVA chat and um, submit any questions about technology in the Zoom. The session today will be recorded and made available available for viewing at a later date. We also apologize in advance for any technical difficulties we encounter and we ask for your patience. And with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Ben Norton. Take it away, Ben. Share my screen. I'm a big fan of this animation. I found it yesterday and I want to show it. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. At the, at this, well, I guess some of you, it's early. Some of you, it's, it's not so, it's after lunch, but um, thanks for coming. So I'm going to give the first presentation. Mine's a little bit longer. Um, it's mostly an intro into APIs to give an overview and sort of a context for the remaining uh, five presentations in this symposium. And so hopefully, I, I know some of you know about APIs. Hopefully you still take something away from it. Um, we're going to go through a couple topics and then transition to really a good overview of different aspects of it, how your APIs are being used and some of the important topics about them. So hopefully you'll get a sort of a diverse overview of these sorts of things too, which is really good. All right, so let's get started. All right, so here's the outline. Um, here's the basic outline. I outline the goals of presentation this, and this symposium, just real quick. And then I'm gonna define the metrics for success of this presentation, which is really important, right? There needs to be some sort of goal and some sort of accomplishment here. 
Um, and I'll show several example, examples of APIs in action. Some are very simple. Um, a couple are more advanced and standardized as things sort of evolve along. Uh, I'll describe several archetypes of APIs. So I've divided these, a lot of APIs into sort of groups. I think it's much better to do it that way to be able to, to better document them and learn how to you know, implement them. And so not just sort of bend them into one group or public or private. Uh, then finally, I'll conclude with a quick overview of current innovative activities and the next steps as, as I see it for APIs. So at the end of the presentation will be a list of resources where you can find more information. I won't get to everything, um, even if you want the extra time. So including uh, participating in several of the current efforts I'm working on. So all the presentation are being archived on the web. So if we get if we don't get the resources at the end, you can always loop back later, email me at Ben Norton, ben.norton at naturalsciences.org. Ben, I hate to interrupt, um, but someone said, could you enunciate um, when you're speaking, just slow down a little bit for the non-native speakers? Okay, here's the thing. So I operate at about 80 miles an hour. And, and I'm slowing down 40, right? I mean, I, I'll, I'll do my best, right? And so if, if you need it, you know, 40, I'm working on. All right, so this is, wolverines are some of my favorite mammals. Um, I like it that at 40 pounds and the bear is 400 pounds, they, they will take on a bear if necessary. It's pretty good. So anyway, so here are the goals were question and answers. So what is an API? How does an API work? Why are APIs important, right? Uh, where can APIs help solve problems, especially in biodiversity and research data publishing? Uh, where are the areas of innovation? It's really important. And then what's next for APIs? Where are we going from here? Right. So let's start with the overview. So application programming interface is the, what API stands for. It's a basic information exchange between two digital entities. It's an architecture style. It's not a piece of software. It's platform agnostic. It's not based on language. You can actually build APIs with multiple languages, Python, PHP, JavaScript, all sorts of things. Uh, APIs have been around for decades, forming the basis for information exchange on operating systems. They go back decades. Windows uses them uh, internally when they have your registry and they two software programs on Windows communicate with one another actually using APIs. Um, so web-based APIs, including the REST architecture, reached a level of maturity over the past decade. Uh, partnered with the proliferation of smartphones, the APIs are now the dominant mechanism for information exchange on the web. Uh, with There are a trillion requests. Uh, Google offers a platform where you can publish your APIs. And over, there were a trillion requests um, between 2018 and 2020 on Google. So it's a pretty simple request and response workflow. This is basically the, the client does a request and the server responds. So, and the server communicates the database, but it's just an exchange back and forth. Resources are the building block of all APIs. Everything's based around resources. And resources are anything that can be named and assigned a unique URI. And there are types. General types and the wider API scope, there's internal and external. Internal or more for, if you have an application, a lot of times, especially with the, the, um, the prominence of JavaScript frameworks, you have, because what, well, JavaScript are front end, they work on the front end, not the, not the server side. And so a lot of times what you'll need is for JavaScript like React or Angular or Vue or Svelte, some, we have some Svelte fans, that you have to have an API for the front end to communicate with the back end. And so they sit in the middle, but they're not for public consumption. You basically get to write them the way you want to and then consume them the way you want to. And so those are internal, they're not publicly exposed. Then they're external, which is what I'm focused on mostly where they are for public consumption. And there's a whole lot more stricter standards and documentation procedures involved with that, but they are, are very different. So they're not, and they're usually just get requests. They're not post or delete and things like that. And then a lot of times you have public and private real quick. Public are obviously uh, publicly offerable. Private refers to things like the infrastructure and large companies. So you might have HR might talk with financial using a private API within their infrastructure. You can't access it from the outside. Usually heightened security as well. So user interfaces. So like I said, application programming interfaces are the exchange of information between two digital entities, but they work kind of like user interfaces. And in user interfaces, there are uh, human and computer. And so this was the first browser built in 1990, 1991 called the World Wide Web. And it was later named Nexus to not confuse it with the World Wide Web. It was built at CERN. Windows 95, if some of us may remember Windows 95. I had a Windows 95 when I went to uh, college. So anyways, it was the first operating system package with Internet Explorer with a browser by default. It was an option early on. It was an add-on as a Windows add-on. And then later on, it was packaged with the operating system itself. So in computing, an interface is a point of contact between two entities where information is exchanged. It's a boundary that controls the flow of information and makes it possible for two things to interact, whether it's a user interface or programming interface. 
It's just different types of entities. And this is the basic flow of information for a user interface just across this UI here. So desktop and user. This is a programming interface between two computers across this API here. Again, it's just a boundary for information exchange. So the web application view gets to the server, which communicates with the backend database and back and forth. So for every URL, which is based around requests, so we're gonna start with requests and go to responses. So request is just a URL. So you have a couple components to the URL. You have the protocol, HTTP, or HTTPS is the preferred these days. Uh, the host name, so you know, gbif.org or naturalsciences.org, the path to that resource. And then the name of the resource is in the URL. So you know, person, uh, program, company, uh, taxonomic checklist, occurrence, things like that are the name of the resources. And these are really important because they don't, resources do not, are usually not the same as the underlying data ta database tables. Uh, database tables are typically created with all kinds of things and for programmatic purposes or not for public viewing. And so resources are much more conceptual. And so along uh, beneath many resources are multiple uh, relational tables. They make up how to define that resource itself. But a resource should be a world, real world concept. It should be understood by humans. So when they see the name of it, they should kind of have a concept of what it is. So you might have person, which might be four tables underlying it with email and user credentials and all kinds of things, but it's one resource. And so exposed to the outside world, it's a concept. And these are examples of two, two of these things. And then at the end, you have key value pairs, which are query parameters. So it's how you characterize the response. And so here you've got a genus and species, and you know, I'm going to limit it to one record if I was going to send it. So responses, JSON, uh, there was a, first there was XML. XML is great. I, I like XML a lot. It has um, defined formats and data types in it. It's very verbose and not as efficient as JSON. JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's a much more efficient, it's very simple. It does not, it has very few data types. It has basically numeric and strings and that's it. So there are some limitations to JSON um, and it's just object and arrays. But in a sense, that's also good because it, it's very efficient. And a lot of times when we're parsing a lot of records, we need something a little more efficient than XML. So it's, it's the most popular use these days. Uh, the JSON schema, this one, oops, this one's really important. This is how you define the structure of JSON. And for responses, this is key. And there's a lot of heterogeneity in the community across the board with your JSON schemas. And that's the structure of your actual JSON file that you get in your response. So headers, um, typically headers should remain as they are. So the format and structure of headers and status codes are fairly consistent. And so a header contains meta information about the request. You don't really see this. If you, if you're not really concerned with it. It's got basically the cache policy, uh, the content type of that is JSON or XML and authentication things. Status codes are standardized, they're numeric codes. So, and they've been issued for a long time and they are already in place. For example, 200 is success. 404 is not found, and many of us have encountered 500 on a website that just didn't work. It's just a catastrophic failure. Uh, 422 is a validation failed. Let's say you send a request in and you're missing some of the required fields. Typically, you want to send back 422. And these are very important because a lot of APIs don't implement status codes thoroughly. Um, it's one of those small shortcomings that you find quite a bit. They may only use 200 and 400, but really there's a whole lot of status codes, and I don't advocate to use all of them but it is important to use them because that's how you tell the user the status of the response. Is it bad or is it really broken? And now a lot of times those are not, there's no distinction there, but you really should. If, if the record doesn't exist, it's still a successful response. It's just telling you that that record you requested does not exist in the database, but you're being, you know, that's still an answer to your question, right? If it's an, then it's an error on the server side and that's a different concept. And so that is really important in your status codes. Uh, the body is what we're concerned with mainly. It's the body that contains the information that's being exchanged. So how do we describe these things? Well, this is where specification comes in. And sometimes there's confusion between these things. So open API is the standardized of how REST APIs and web APIs are described. They are a speci specification for documentation, for describing APIs, not the APIs themselves. So, and there's also Swagger, you, a lot of times you hear open API and Swagger used interchangeably. Well, Swagger was a specification up until 2016. When Swagger specification got transferred to open, a, open API specification. And now Swagger refers to the tools that allows you to interact with open API specification. Basically for an API, an open, I, open API specification is basically one file that defines all of your endpoints in a certain format in a certain way. It's got required fields and optional fields and so forth. 
And Swagger are the things, usually that user interface that a lot of us have seen is a Swagger interface, allowing you to exchange, to interact with the information in your open API specification. So let's talk about inaction. So these are two web applications I built. One is our online collections at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Another is our collections asset manager where I can manage all of our digital assets. We have 27,000 digital assets in that management system. Things like collection cards, field notes, um, let's see, uh, best species images, 3D models, all these sort of digital assets are all managed in the thing called the CAM system, the collection asset manager. I think acronyms are are very important for web applications. It's just easier to remember. So all, all things I usually build have acronyms of some sort. And our online collections is our search interface. Uh, it's got a few other things, but basically it allows you to search our collections and then download the data you search for or view it on a map and so forth. But they are two independent systems. They do reside on the same server, but they're not, they don't share the underlying database. They are separate from one another. So to communicate, they need, they use an API. So let's start with the image. So you upload, let's create a resource. We want to create an image resource on the CAM system. And so we'll upload an image and that creates our resource. And now it has a unique, a unique URI, which is right there, the cams.naturalsciences.org, API assets, assets ID is how I define it, just a basic generic numeric code. There are many ways, and you could argue better ways to do image IDs in this sort of sense, but for this particular purpose, this one is not publicly available and numeric IDs are pretty much the simplest type of identifier you can do just the primary key in a table. And so that's how I've done it. So this is the interface for the collection asset manager. We've got a Cooper talk. So I found one on Wiki Commons and uploaded it. And then I, I know there's one Cooper talk in our ornithology collection. And so on the bottom right, you can see that I assigned it that catalog number. So 23978. So what I've done is I've uploaded and I've created a resource on our CAM system. And then I've assigned it a collection identifier, which in this happens to be catalog number 23978 in our ornithology collection. I could use field number, I could use previous catalog number and a suite of other things, but in this case, I'm using catalog number as the identifier. So here's our workflow. So now we've created a resource, we have our unique URI, we've assigned it a catalog number so we can associate it with the specimen, and that's the top area. Well, then we're gonna search our collection and we're gonna step through this quick workflow. So here's our request. We're gonna search for the collection. We're gonna search for catalog number 23978. Uh, we're gonna get a view of the specimen view. And then we're gonna say, well, is there an image here? Because not all our specimens have images. And to have an image associated with the specimen, you have to create it in CAM system and associate it. So a lot of specimens don't have images, right? We haven't taken pictures or not uploaded it for a variety of different reasons. So, and that's our request. Like, do you have a, an image? So here's the URI. For this, you have collection ID two, which is, the ornithology collection and catalog number 23978. So I've sent that request, hey, do you have an image? And either comes back with a 404 not found or it gives back a success. I have an image for this particular specimen and that's our response. So here's the search interface. So quick search, 23978 catalog number, and we're all set. Here's the record. And then I'm gonna click view individual specimen. And here's that specimen right now. So when you click that button, it's gonna say, okay, now is there an image for this particular specimen? So it's gonna send out that request. And right now it's blank. This is where the images go. So we're now we're right here. So we got the view, the specimen view. We're gonna say, hey, do you have an image? And then it's gonna let us know. This is the data. It does have an image because we just assigned it. And so this is the quick body. This is not standardized. This is very simple, um, but JSON's not that bad. So a lot of it can be very long um, and I'm working on different visualizations for Jason. I think to get imp better implementation, we need to be able to better visualize how JSON structured in different ways, using a better dynamic for more interactive web interface. I've got some ideas, I'm still working on it, but this one's very simple. So when you upload something to cams, it does a couple fancy things. Uh, it creates three copies of the image on different sizes. So if I wanna show thumbnails for a gallery, it generates one that's 250 uh, width. So that's really important because if you know you need things more efficient than maybe some massive images. Our HERP collection ledgers, for example, are 10,000 by 8,000. And so you're not gonna show a 10,000 by 8,000 thing on, on a web interface any, with any sort of efficiency. Um, so this is why it's important to create a couple of copies. So there's our catalog number. In a response, I think it's very, very, very important to return 
the information that you in your request. So you get it back to you. So you can basically backtrack to find out how you got the information in that response. And that's very important. It's like having, everybody has Excel spreadsheets on their computer that they have no idea what's, you know, they look at it and like, I have no idea when I created this or what this stuff is, right? And so this is kind of that same thing. And it helps when you have a content worksheet in your workbook that just has even just a title, when you did it and describing of what it is. And this is kind of the idea is that I've got catalog number in orthology collection. So if I see this JSON, if I save it, I can always go back and get that request again. So here it is. So now we post the image. And you can do this right now on the online collection. There's a lot of collections cards. We inherited, um, donated uh, some major collections from a couple of places, including Charleston, and we scanned all the collection cards. And so a lot of these specimens, and especially our ichthyology collection, herpetology and mollusks have collection cards with them. And so it's really nice. You can go through and actually visit the assets and it does it dynamically. I could remove this image and then it removes it from the specimen. I could add six images over the CAM system and they'll automatically populate right here if I assign them the right catalog number. So here's our request parameters, ornithology and the collection number, uh, catalog number. And there's the URL. And here's our response, very simple. So now let's talk about art types. So when I began working and building APIs, oh, I guess maybe two years ago, a year ago, uh, it became quickly apparent that specific use cases and best practices, documentation techniques, and standardization approaches are best targeted to groups of like API points. Things have different purposes and different reasons we use them. And so it became much more, it became much better. If I'm gonna standardize responses and documentation and more target their uses, group these things a little better than what's out there. And also there's not a lot of, work been done on standardizing things within research data and biodiversity. And so this was really important. Uh, so a service oriented on the right API is not really a new concept. There's a lot of service oriented APIs out there. The distinction in this context is new though. And so they perform some task or function. That's the idea. They are internal, external. They support existing platforms or workflows. You can integrate them into your collection management system as a pick list for a list of values, um, as a taxonomy checklist and these sorts of things. They also, so, and then products are the real difference maker here. And that's what I've done. You'll see I, two days ago, I finally pushed out my first standardized response for uh, the reptile database. So it technically does have an API. I just, Peter gave a great presentation yesterday and I didn't quite get uh, the email to him in time. It was late the night before. And, uh, but he, it does have an API. And so it has the first standardized response. And so I'll get to that at the end, but any feedback. Um, so I've built a lot of software that people depend on every day for our institution operations. And one of the ways, you know, if, if something, if this, if the API publishing platform breaks tomorrow, nobody's going to get to work and not be able to do their job, right? But I have built software that that does happen. And so one of the ways you make things sustainable is you get a group of people and you ask them to hit it as hard as you can, poke every hole in it. <laughs> and it takes a bit of a backbone, but basically I want you to give as harshest feedback as possible. And if it stands up to that, then you're good. And so, and sometimes it's not the easiest thing to deal with if you're on my end. But at the end of the day, uh, it's just constructive. And so please, if you see the standardized response and you think it's completely wrong, like, why did you do this? I, I would, I really, really think it's important to hear that, even though, and don't hesitate, really don't. And so I think sometimes people do just out of, I think, out of respect, but really don't, because if things are going to be sustainable, you got to hit them, right? So anyway, so products are the data products. They're the reptile database. They're things like uh, that GBIF publish, that sort of things. They, are, they do not perform a function. They are in products of data. So just like they're a published data set basically. And they have a standardized uniform response that you can put together. And this is where I've done most of standardization. I'm working on services, they're a little more complicated. They have subtype things. Then you have the relational model. This is where a lot of APIs are done. This is things like software, a collection management suite has basic operations. It, it's, it's an API for a relational model where you have one-to-many relationships and primary keys and, and expansive tables. They're not in products. And these APIs don't necessarily perform a certain task or function. What they do is they allow you to interact with the underlying relational data model. Uh, JSON API, which is gonna be in a session after this, are ideal for this kind of um, architecture, for this kind of API archetype, uh, because they're, they have, they're focused on the relationships within an API themselves, they have these great linkages. But they're not necessarily that great, I found for products or services. And I'll show you why. So here's our relational 
your basic, if you ever hear about CRUD operations, I wish there was a better acronym for this, but it's create, read, update, delete. So we have our resources, our conceptual models, and then we can interact with these using a basic CRUD operations. So post is a, these are types of requests. Mostly I'd handle Git. Git just goes and gets something and brings it back. Patch is technically not a request. It's actually a post request. But what it does is it only updates fields that have changed. And so they call it patch, but it's really just a different type of post request, but it does a quick diff. Then only up, if you've only updated, if you've got 10 columns and you only update two, it's only gonna update those two. Um, post is to create a new resource. And then of course, delete is, you know, delete. So these are our products. So these are, you can do these in the subtypes. And so I've got checklist traits and geography in uh, my data publishing platform at the moment. And these are some of those URLs. Uh, notice there's a reptile database here. And if you click on this, you actually can see the, the schema itself. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind products. So again, the first release of a standardized response for data products is available now. And I, I'll put something maybe up later or something. So it's now available for review and I'll have, a, I'm getting the GitHub repository together and these sorts of things. I need to document it, right? So there, there are certain features that it does not have yet, like an open API specification, right? And I'm getting there, it's just, I really, it was really important to get this standardized response schema down pat. And there were several fields that were very important. So once I got that logged in, I'm gonna again go and document them. Uh, so let's talk about services. So these are really important for existing workflows. So let's say I've got a latitude and longitude in my collection management system. I think we're all well aware of the amount of error in uh, geographic locations that we find in our collections. It's just a natural thing. So if I have a latitude and longitude, so let's say I went in GPS and this is typically for new data, you can't go back and do historical this way, but you can for this. So I've got a latitude and longitude. Well, I don't really need to enter my country first order or second order geopolitical division. I could just generate that from the latitude and longitude. So then what happens, I eliminate the air. I take the human part out of it. So let's say I've got latitude and longitude here. I send a request and I get back this response. Oops. It's Anson County, North Carolina in the United States. And so now I populate these fields in my collection management system and I'm done. So this is, this is great. I mean, this, you know, as long as you don't make a mistake on your latitude and longitude, um, all this is automatically populated. Not only does it automatically pop where you remove the issues of spelling, or, or I think a lot of probably Puerto Rico is a country because we had a technician that didn't quite know where to put it, even though Puerto Rico is a territory, which is a first order geopolitical division, this eliminates that issue. And so it automatically populates, it's also quicker, right? I just type that in and I get the end result, I'm good. It also allows us to standardize the vocabulary. So I use countries from a certain standard. I use counties from a certain standard, you know, the international standard, or if you go to um, the, what is it? The uh, countries of the world, there's the, there's the uh, UN, the Board of Geographic Names and the international standard for countries. You have long things like the Islamic Republic of Iran or just Iran and, and so forth. So controlled vocabularies, this is where services really come in. A lot of the work I'm focusing on as well. Um, so it can support the digitization process, which we just saw. Uh, the QAQC, you could run an API against existing data and then flag those values that are inconsistent. And that requires probably human decision afterwards. Things like, um, you know, we talk about that we need verbatim values for certain things. If we have something from 1930 that has Western Germany, do we change it to Germany or do we not? And so typically we don't, but if we run an API with a standardized country list, that's gonna give a, a flag for a conflict, that it's not a valid value. So you do need human intervention because you say, well, actually that is in this particular context. And then it supports retrieval as well. You can use those same fields to make pick lists for your search interface, things like taxonomy or type status and that sort of thing. So next steps, Mr. Craig. So standardization. So Establishment of des design best practices. This is a highly sort of contested field in the field of APIs. Um, things like how do you do your, even little details like do you use plural or singular nouns in your request? These are actually really important. And so do you use full body you know, status codes? Um, how do you structure your response, right? These are all really important. Do you include, I have API as a part of the path and the subdomain, which is, which <laughs> it's not, I need to change that because it's redundant, right? And these are best practices that are really very, very important. And they do require a lot of time. They're not important necessarily for internal because you're not exposing them, but for external, they're essential. And there's a huge amount of variability. And Ian's gonna talk about that in his presentation a little more in depth. So I'm not gonna touch on too much of it here, but anyways, and so let's see. So components of API can be standardized, requests, response bodies, documentation. 
Uh, things like, do we use open API is actually not the only documentation uh, specification. It's the most popular and the most widely used, but it's not the only one. And in fact, I actually, a lot of people, including myself, don't like the Swagger interface. I think it's terrible. And so there are better interfaces, but you know, I think standard overways are subjective sort of design opinions about how things, I mean, it does work. And in fact, scientists are actually, I've built a lot of things and scientists are actually the less picky about interfaces and about design, believe it or not, they really are. And so it's usually, if it works, we're good. If I can get the data I want, we're good. I don't particularly care about the design. A lot, a lot of other you know, things I've worked on, it's all design. You change a color on a button, it's like the end of the world, right? It's, it's just, you know, everybody has an opinion and things. So anyways, so there are a few standards for response body. The Open Geospatial Consortium has ex very detailed, it has six volumes of specifications for APIs. It is, it is daunting, but it is really good. And so I've modeled, I'm working on modeling some of my services after the OGC. I mean, they have everything from the root URL of an API, what goes there to every single path term in the path, including the end resource. And it's really, really good. And that's why also why you have web mapping services and web feature services that are all standardized whenever you use them. That's from the OGC API. And so it's really good. Um, JSON API is another very popular one. I'm gonna talk about that later. I think it's great for relational models and internal linkages, um, but it, for data products, you know, data products have things like metadata. It has the source, it has a citation. It has these fields we talk about, the DOIs. And those necessarily aren't fields in JSON API. And so, but you don't, you need them for products. We don't necessarily need them for relational schema. I mean, you may if you query collection objects or something, but overall it's not really the focus of it, right? And so here's an example of, a, we're gonna talk about two response bodies. This is the catalog of life, not too complicated. This is your basic metadata about the request. And then you've got classification, usage, these sorts of things. So what I'm gonna show is the reason standardization is so important is because currently every response body is out there is different. And so if I'm gonna write some code that merges responses from different APIs, I have to customize the code to each individual response body. It's not very efficient and it's taken away. It's not empowering the user. It's more empowering the developer, which is never a really good scenario. And so it's also very time intensive. And so standardized response bodies allow me to create a single code base and interpret all of these things the same way, which then empowers the user more to merge the data and handle the data as they want to, because it's very simple to sort of take everything together. And so you can see this response body here. It's got a lot of great information. And so, but you have the principal ones are classification and then usage and then metadata, right? Let's look at GBIF. GBIF is great. It's got the nearly identical, uh, but if you can see even here, see results, and then on catalog life, it's got result. So since this is an array, it really ought to be results. I, I'm a big fan of GBF API. I think you guys do a great job on this. Because um, I mean, maybe it seems particular, but this is a bracket is an array. It's a set of objects, not just one. And so they've got results here, which I really like. If you're in catalog of life, I don't mean to dismiss you, you know what I mean? Don't really criticize, but I mean, it is an array, right? And so at any rate, so you've got these values in your GBIF response. Um, there happens to be no descriptions with this. We're looking at red foxes and the rank of species, higher classification, all these sorts of things. So let's abbreviate them. So here's the thing. So if I'm writing my code and I've got these two response bodies and I wanna merge the records, I wanna merge all my red fox records from different sources. Well, you can see here, they're different structures. You have everything under usage here, which is a singular object and you have results and result array. And then you've got a lot of similar terms here for catalog of life and GBIF. This is actually pretty good. Uh, compared to a lot of things. So you've got scientific name, you know, you've got authorship, which is great. You've got genus, rank, all these sorts of things that mirror one another. This one does have the HTML. A lot of things use that. So it makes it very easy to display it on a web page. They sort of do some work for you, which is really nice, um, but it's not totally necessary. But then you've got vernacular names and things over here as well. And so it, it's, it's different. And what happens is if I want to show this on a web page, I got to write two different dot notations. So this is the first object in our results array. And then I want to do authorship. And to get authorship on catalog of life, I take the result array, first object, usage, and then authorship. And so that's a custom code base built around each specific UI. And that's not an efficient way of doing things. This is just like data standards, right? Having multiple things and trying to map them all together. So if we have a standardized interface, the nice thing here is that you don't necessarily need to modify the underlying structures and platforms. You can have a common interface, like a common model, and data flows through that to the outlying things. And so the, the information exchange is through a common interface. And so you can see here system A is out to system B, 
through, I guess some of the letters are comp, but imagine this is a D and this is a, this is an F, right? So you have these systems and then back again, the system A and this common interface. If you have a common response body, all these things can work on the same field, the same platform, the same format. So areas innervation, I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm gonna try to get through this. Uh, and Ben important is a client integration, trying to take these really technical concepts and make them simple. And so I think that's really important because APIs are a bit more complicated than looking at columns on a spreadsheet. Um, and so here we go. So best practices, these need to be established. Things like how to structure URLs, how do you structure your response bodies, a uh, community agreement and consensus, which is always fun. Uh, how do you get a community of people to form a consensus, uh, which is also challenging. Uh, define these archetypes and then response body standardization, like I talked about with having citations. And you'll see that if you go to the reptile database endpoint, you'll see at the bottom, I've got citation, data policy, licenses, all these sorts of things. And then I separate things about the request, like the count, the limit, things like this in a separate array called meta and then request, because that's not necessarily the same thing, right? You've got information about the request and then you have the data you're after. And those really belong in two separate arrays to better parse them better, because they're not the same thing. They're under different context. And then I think it really, all your information about how you got that data should be included in the response as well. So I can backtrack it. I just like prints a lot of science, right? And you can sort of do it again. And that is the end. So not too bad, 32 minutes. I could do two hours. So anyways, uh, thank you. I know it's early. Thanks for, thanks for attending and, and sitting through a, a bit of a longer presentation. And so that's about it. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we have a couple of questions. The first one is, can the JSON, the re can you request the JSON schema of the response or is that in the documentation? That is a fantastic, that's a fantastic idea. You, you could, JSON schema is a different format. It's got a particular format of how it looks. So it's not the same as JSON. It's, it's, it looks very similar, but it's not, it's not the sort of the same. However, that's a really good point. And it would make a lot of sense to include a, at least a link to it in the metadata about the request itself. So along with parameters, maybe that URL, you have a link to the schema that you actually, uh, that you have, the response body is, adheres to. So I think it's a really good idea. Not currently, I, I haven't thought of that, but I, I need to put these sort of, they generating a schema from response is also new as well. And so um, I put into a GitHub repository, but that, that sounds, that's, a, that's a fantastic idea because you can always just include a sort of a static link based on the resource. So that's, that's really good. Thank you. And a, a second question, are you aware of the Sparkle microservices, which was presented yesterday, no. I believe. Yes. So <laughs> that's a whole separate, yes. And, and that's fantastic work. I, I, I am familiar with that. Um, I, I, I'm kind of a solitary. I, I like, sometimes it's easier just to get things done and, and yourself and just sort of plow ahead and, and you're accountable for everything, but I get to make all the decisions. And if, if you're right, right, because I'm always right, right. Um, it, it makes things a lot easier. So I do need to go look at that. I, I know it's very important. I know there's a lot of great work being done on that in that way. Um, I'm trying to focus on a few little different things and a few different focus, but um, I, I do need to, it, I have, and I need to get more in depth to it. That and GraphQL, graph databases seem a bit daunting, but they, you know, everybody tells you they're fantastic and they give better responses. Now, I don't doubt it, but you know, at the same time, you know, you get to a certain age and I still use Subversion. Subversion is great. I mean, how could you, you know? So anyways, but thank you for that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Lots of um, thank yous in the chat. And with that, we will invite our second presenter, Ian Engelbrecht. All right, thank you very much. Um, just give me one moment to get it ready here. Okay, have you guys got it? Thumbs up? Yes, looks yeah. good, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, all right, so, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about a short survey um, that we did of APIs, just to try and get a sense of how standardized they are or, or how uniform they are, um, with a view to answering this question we have here, does Tadwig need an API design guideline? So um, Ben's already covered uh, some of the stuff I'm presenting here, but um, there's no harm in hearing things twice. So um, an API is basically like a, a middleman between uh, some kind of data database or a service uh, that can be used by a wide range of different, um, different users. 
um, or, or, or platforms. So, um, so you can uh, you can access an, an API directly from a uh, from a web browser. Um, you can pull data from an API straight into Excel or into a tool like OpenRefine. Um, or what people more typically do is they access APIs through some kind of programming language like Python or JavaScript or anything like that. So um, again, so Ben Ben did cover this stuff in quite a lot of detail, but but the way that we access APIs is through a through a simple URL. Like this is something which um, which I think. Uh, people who might not be experienced with APIs or, or familiar with APIs um, aren't often aware of is that it's, it's simply just a URL like you would use for any web page um, that retrieves uh, some kind of resource and it's made up of various bits. So you've got the protocol here at the beginning, um, you've got your domain, and then we've got what we call a path or, or what people typically call API endpoints, uh, which are like sort of uh, components of your API or particular parts of your API that return uh, particular types of data. And then um, at the end, we've got what we call a query string, which is denoted by this little question mark. And I like this because it's, it's kind of saying, you know, okay, what do we want from this particular endpoint? Well, give me records with a species name of AS. AS. Um, so, uh, if you have a look in your in your chats um, or, or in the in the Wover chat, um, I'm going to try and uh, drop this URL quickly here. So this is for the people here who've never used a um, an API before. If you've never used an API, um, there's an end, a little URL that um, that's dropped in the chat, and you can literally take that, copy it, paste it, and stick it into your browser. Um, it's, um, it's for a service called the, the ADU Virtual Museum, which is uh, a citizen science platform here in South Africa. And um, that API gives you the list of projects um, uh, that, that run on that particular, um, on, on that particular um, citizen science platform. And um, you're probably just, if you've never used an API in your browser before, you're probably gonna get some horrible big blob of text back that you can't make any sense of, but that is data, that's JSON data. So, um, oh, so, so um, importantly, this little bit here in front of the main part of the domain is called a subdomain, and uh, I'll return to that a little bit later. So when I started working with APIs, like I said, I thought they were quite scary until I started building them, and you see that they're actually very, very simple. So this is just some uh, basic node uh, code here. Um, which 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 gives you gives you a very uh, basic API endpoint. So we import something here called Express, which is a tool for building uh, uh, web interfaces or, or web apps. Um, I import something called MySQL, which is um, what gives me access to a My, to a MySQL database. Um, I have to create my web app. So I'm just saying from Express, create this thing called a web app, and I need to create a connection to my database. So that's what we're doing here: create connection with my password, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then what I say is I'm going to create this endpoint um, on my app, uh, which is it's going to be a get endpoint. It accepts get requests to an endpoint called taxon, and it takes a, an ID, um, and then you tell it what to do with the request and the response and what this thing does. So anytime, it, anytime the uh, server receives a request to this taxon endpoint with an ID, it, uh, it's going to write the SQL statement. So SQL uh, uh, select star from the taxon table where the taxon I, um, where the taxon ID is uh, is this ID that came in here um, in the endpoint. Um, it fetches that from the database. So it's basically saying database execute that SQL that I just created, uh, which gives me a list of taxa in the fields. We're not worried about the fields. Um, and then it's just saying in the response uh, return. So so give me a JSON response with the first taxon, um, and then it sets it running. App listen on port eighty, and and that's um, that's essentially all it is. You've got a basic API running, and um, these APIs return JSON typically. Um, I think the days of returning um, XML data from from APIs are, are sort of um, uh, uh, the sun is setting. Um, and so JSON gives these objects that, um, JSON is made up of these objects that describe the data that you're getting back. So in this case, we've got a taxon ID, the scientific name field, um, and so on. And um, the way that I like to think about these JSON objects is that they're enclosed in these nice curly brackets. And it's like, it's like a nice notation that says to you, this is a, a, a self-contained entity 
um, with these various properties uh, describing that entity and, uh, and we can call that an object. Now, when you call an actual API, you typically get a result um, back that looks like this. It's a JSON object to begin with, but it's got, um, uh, it's got various uh, parts to it. Um, typically, there's some information about um, uh, the total amount of data that, you, that is available um, for what you've requested. And um, so something about how many records there are, how many pages there are, if you're calling them 20 at a time. And then we've got this uh, results property here, which um, is typically an array of these objects. It's, uh, that's, your, that's your result. So we looked at, um, I think it was uh, six or seven taxon APIs, APIs that return uh, uh, taxonomic data. Um, this is not meant to be a, a critical review in any kind of way. It's literally just meant to be a survey. And we looked at the structure of the requests um, that, they, uh, that they take, as well as the responses. And we looked at things like the URL structures and um, terms used in the responses and, and so on. And um, so one of the things we looked at, so I'm gonna look at responses first. Um, so is API indicated in the URL and where is it? So do people use a subdomain or do they use it as part of the, as part of the, uh, um, the, the sort of the endpoint path? And um, we found two that don't use it at all. So that URL doesn't tell you it's an API. Some of them use a subdomain, some of them use a URI segment, and we found one that actually uses both. Um, is the API versioned? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes we weren't sure whether what was presented in the URL was actually a version or not. Um, do the API endpoints use nouns or verbs? So is the API endpoint something like search or is it something like taxon? So you're, you're no, you know that you're searching for a taxon. Um, nouns, um, we had, uh, sometimes it's nouns. We had one case where it was a verb, but very often you have both. You have um, a search endpoint and a taxon um, endpoint in the same um, API working on, and the, this is just for returning taxa. Um, and if they have nouns, are those nouns referred to as Darwin core classes? We found one that's yes, most of the time uh, they're not. And then looking at the, at the responses, um, the details here are not important. Um, I, I'm not going to go into too much depth with this, but we can talk about the shape of the response, which is, which is essentially just an indication of its structure. Um, and you can see here, so these are two responses from two different tags on APIs. You can see they have different shapes. Um, one of them actually has a nested object inside the main object, which has the name data. Um, and as Ben was explaining, what, what that means is more work uh, for somebody wanting to consume your APIs um, and, and actually make use of them. Um, uh, so uh, we also looked, if you, if you um, send a URL that, is, um, that has the ID as part of the path, are you getting back one object or do you get back an array? Do you get a, a similar response to if you send a query? Most of the time you do, but uh, one of them doesn't. Um, and then this question, are the properties that you get back in your response objects actually Darwin core terms? Um, sometimes they are, but um, most of the time they're not. Um, so the standard is not coming through into the way that people are building APIs. Um, ben mentioned this as well. So this is this array of um, response objects. These are actual, the results of your, um, of your query. Sometimes it's called result, results, records, taxon concepts. Um, so, so there isn't any standardization there. Um, and if we, what, so, so um, what, what field is being used to return the taxon name? Sometimes it's called scientific name, scientific name with an underscore, uh, name, full name. Uh, so a variety of different fields being used. And if there is a scientific name, does it include the author? So the, uh, the uh, definition of the scientific name in Darwin Core is that it should include the taxon authority. Um, but most of the time, um, APIs don't return that. Okay, so what is an API design guideline? Um, it's very simply a document that, uh, that describes the way that APIs should be built. Um, there are many, many um, examples available online. Um, what I would suggest is um, if you're interested to take a look at them is go straight to this apistylebook.com. Uh, they, they basically just um, 
uh, provide links out to a whole range of other um, design guidelines. But um, the, the design, gui design guideline basically stipulates things like how your um, requests should be structured and what the res responses should be included. They basically include all of the details as pointers um, for, for people building APIs. So um, yeah, so they look at things like, um, you know, do we use nouns versus verbs? Do we have singular or plural um, if they are nouns? Where do you indicate API? Um, do you, uh, what, are the, what are the terms that you should be using in a query string if you've got query strings on the end of your, your API? Um, uh, this is just a little detour quickly into the world of GUIDs. Um, there's been some nice discussion going on um, in, in, uh, in Hoover about this and in, in the various chats, this is something that I'm trying to understand better. And, um, and I, think, I think when you think about GUIDs in terms of how we should be using them in APIs, um, you, you get a nice distinction between um, using an internal identifier. Typically when you have a, an API endpoint that looks like this with the ID on the end, you're actually referring to the uh, internal primary key value for a taxon record in your database. Whereas I think with GUIDs, um, we should be um, calling them. I think it's, it's possibly more semantically correct to be calling them using the actual GUID um, term from something like Darwin Core as, as, part of a, um, as part of a query string. But that's a, a discussion for another day. Um, so um, back to API design guidelines. So in responses, do we want to be using things like Darwin Core, um, uh, Darwin Core terms, names? Do we want namespace prefixes on our Darwin Core terms? Um, how do we provide back the pagination uh, data? Um, standardized structure, status codes, all of, all of that kind of stuff. Um, ben also drew this distinction between APIs that are externally facing and internally facing APIs. Um, so I think Max is going to be talking about this in his specified talk. But um, one of the things that's important to note here is when you have a distinction between the two um, or when people's apps talk directly to their databases, there's often um, some sort of asynchronicity between the API and, and what, that, what the database is actually uh, doing so people recommend that apps should be built on top of your API so that you 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 have an incentive to keep your API up to date and functional. So what's the way forward? Um, we um, so so my thinking is just to uh, in terms of uh, requests to APIs we can probably as a community pick a particular API guideline and tweak it to our needs um, for our particular domain the biodiversity data domain. Um, in terms of responses, I think it's a much uh, bigger and more difficult question. Um, we've got things like extended di digital specimens happening. Uh, we've got options like JSON API. And um, there was that really great talk about um, a, um, a narrow design pattern for JSON LD, which um, Steve Baskoff gave on the first day. So that brings us back to the first question. Um, given all of that, does Tadwig need an API design guideline? Thank you very much. Um, and I've got to get back to stop sharing. Okay, thanks guys. So Ian, you have a couple of um, uh, questions in the chat. Um, the one is about an interest group, which is, um, let's see, maybe there's another, okay, so there's a biodiversity services and clients interest group that has made an attempt before to identify common principles for service APIs. At that time, they started with the analysis of existing APIs. Unfortunately, it never generated a lot of interest, but perhaps would be another opportunity to bring it to life. And, uh, perhaps now would be an opportunity. So um, not, maybe not so much a question, but perhaps you'd be interested at, or others that are watching as well. And let's see, could you post those links to API guidelines in the chat after your talk? Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. And do you have any recommendation of the best way to page through results? There seems Sorry, it, it just jumped on me. There seems many potential ways and it's easy to make mistakes that are hard to spot. 
Yeah, um, there are many ways. Um, I mean, I think all of this stuff needs to be discussed um, quite a lot and, and tried out. But the way that I like the most is when um, your API actually returns the URL for your next page of results uh, in the metadata. So, so it increments your offset and your um, sets the limit and all that kind of stuff. So you're literally just looping through um, through the, the APIs that the, the, the URLs that the API returns itself. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> I apologize when I introduced you, I did not mention that you are with the Natural Science Collections facility, but it was on yeah. your slide. So thank you. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, we will invite Max Patik. I had our third presenter and he is with the Specify Collections Consortium. Thank you, Max. Hi, everybody. My name is Max Petiu and I'm a web developer at Specify Software Consortium. Today's talk is going to be about the importance of increasing quality standards when publishing internal APIs to external users. And I'm also going to share a case study from our experience and the challenges we face in the process. Most modern web services consist of a backend that stores and processes the data and the front end that displays the data to the user and waits for the input. Since users accessing your product only sees the front end, the communication between the backend and the front end doesn't get much attention. It's usually implemented using internal APIs, which rarely have documentation or automated tests for that matter. But later, if you decide to make these APIs available to developers of third party tools, for example, to allow for integrations between different products, then suddenly there is a much higher quality expected of the APIs. They must have comprehensive documentation that is always up to date as well as on the fly validation with meaningful error messages to help diagnose the issue. And most importantly of all, a consistent uptime as customers have very little tolerance for downtime. OpenAPI is a machine readable API documentation specification that can help significantly with fulfilling these requirements by helping to automate testing and other common maintenance tasks. It allows one to formally describe the input parameters for each API endpoint and the range of possible responses. Later, this information can be used to provide on the fly request validation, automated testing, and to create interactive documentation. But first, let's talk about our use case. Specify 7 is a biological collections data management platform developed by Specify Collections Consortium. This presentation summarizes the uh, challenges and lessons learned in the process of publishing the existing backend Specify 7 APIs to a public facing external API. Each Specify 7 instance comes with around 200 resources and a standard set of create, read, update, and delete operations for each of those. Additionally, there are endpoints for bulk data import, adding attachments, handling user application, and permission management. Uh, due to a high number of endpoints, manually adding the open API schema for each was like out of the question. Instead, we decided to utilize the existing infrastructure as much as possible. For example, the open API schema for all CRUD operations is inferred from the data model. And this is why any data model changes would automatically update the open API schema. Other endpoints like all the data import, attachments, and user permissions are implemented in the code as functions, with each having a doc string describing the request parameters and the role of an endpoint. The functions also have decorators, argument types, and return types. All of that information can be parsed and converted to a schema. It was just a matter of making sure that every endpoint had a doc string description and writing a script for converting that to open API. The auto-generated schema was reasonably good, with only a few endpoints still needing further manual adjustments. The only problem with this approach is the fact that endpoint descriptions may get out of date when the code changes, for example, which in turn would generate an incorrect schema. For this and other reasons, we wrote a testing framework that leads the schema from endpoint, automatically generates permutations of 
request parameters based on that, uh, sends a dozen of different requests to that endpoint, and compares all of the responses against the schema. If any response doesn't match the schema, we know that either the schema is out of date or there is a bug in the code. In either way, that testing framework automates a lot of testing. Additionally, it can even be configured to test a whole chain of requests where each response depends on the previous request. For example, create a resource, then fetch it, update it, and finally delete it. We also wrote a library called LMTest to handle the scheduling of these automatic tests, as well as log retention and error reporting via webhooks. Another really cool outcome of having open API schema and the testing framework was the ability to add on the fly request and response validation. Every request you send to our API is firstly going through the testing framework where the request parameters are validated. And if any parameters are invalid or missing, a developer-friendly error message is generated. And so the employee itself doesn't have to worry about validating the request anymore. For example, this is the error I received when I forgot to pass a required get parameter. Uh, but then if I pass a parameter but don't provide a value or provide a value of incorrect data type, a different error message is displayed. It's even able to validate the request body of a post request. For example, in this case, the request object had a missing property. Finally, but not less important, the open API schema can be converted into auto-generated interactive documentation. For example, this is a documentation for specified seven endpoints. Each endpoint is described here, along with the request parameters, the response schema, and you could even try out sending the request to the endpoints right out of the documentation. I would like to conclude my presentation with an overview of exciting technologies that can help us further improve our APIs. So at the moment, we used version 3.0 of the OpenAPI specification, but the most recent one is 3.1, which aims to improve compatibility with JSON schema. And this is why it would allow integration with JSON schema validation frameworks. Unfortunately, at the moment, OpenAPI 3.1 is not yet very well supported by practically any tools. And that is why we are just staying hopeful that this may change in the future, for example, in the next year or so. But a far more exciting technology is GraphQL. It forces all endpoints to be strongly typed, but in return gives us on the file request validation, the response validation, auto generated documentation, and great flexibility. Not to mention there is an active community, so testing frameworks are abundant. So the biggest drawback of migrating to GraphQL for us is that it would require rewriting all of our APIs or adding and maintaining an abstraction layer on top of our existing RESTful endpoints. As a reminder, here are the technologies and tools we discussed today. Open API, the machine readable API documentation specification, then the testing framework, which is available on GitHub, LM test, the test scheduler and error reporter, and GraphQL, the next generation API design language. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and learned something new. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now, or you can email me later. My contact information is on the screen, and have a good day. Thank you so much for that video. Max and Max is also here live and can answer any questions. We don't have any posted right now, um, but uh, you can post them and Max is here to answer them in the chat. Fantastic. And with that, we will uh, move to our next presenter, Amy Stewart. And Amy is with the University of Kansas Biodiversity Institute. And uh, we also have a video from Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Hi, my name is Amy Stewart, and I am a software developer at the University of Kansas Biodiversity Institute, working in the informatics division. 
Our three primary projects are Specify, LifeMapper, and Biotify. Many of you might be familiar with Specify. Max talked about it earlier. It's content management system for natural history collections, supported by the Specify Con Collections Consortium with its technical staff at KU. The consortium has 77 member institutions in 14 countries. KU Informatics is also the home of the LifeMapper project, which supports workflows and tools for modeling species distributions using high-performance computing. Biotify is a six-year collaboration between LifeMapper and the University of Florida and University of Michigan, including researchers from IDIC Bio and the Open Tree of Life. Biotify builds on the computational infrastructure of LifeMapper by adding workflows that add in the phylogenetic dimension to large numbers of species distributions, and then allows them to be analyzed at landscape scales. Last year, we began moving in the direction of the envisioned architecture and designed a network and computational infrastructure to link the front end of Specify 7 to public data source resources, especially aggregators like GBIF and IDIC Bio and name authorities like IDIS and WORMS, and also to the computational services of Biotify. We'd like to talk about, we call our new integration architecture the Specify Network. Now I'd like to talk about two essential pieces of our infrastructure for network integration, the data broker and the specify resolver. The primary component of the specify network is the broker, an API based tool that uses a specify assigned globally unique identifier or GUID mapped to the Darwin core occurrence ID field. This diagram represents specify collections requesting available information from the specify network, which brokers the request. The broker component queries an ever increasing group of providers for extended data linked by the GUID and standardizes the responses. The broker also retrieves and standardizes the local collection object so it can present the specify record values in tandem with aggregator, aggregator copies to identify differences and enhancements. The component that manages specify record resolution to the home copy is the specify resolver. The resolver maintains minimal information on records in registered specify collections, including GUID, record type, date, and a URL. To populate the resolver, specify exports its records as a Darwin Core archive to the resolver. The resolver responds differently depending on whether the archive contains URLs to each record or not. For collections with a public server and directly addressable records, the resolver simply indexes the GUIDs with their corresponding URLs. For specified collections without a public server, the resolver first sends the Darwin Core records to the specified cache, which indexes each record and provides a public URL to it, then returns the GUID URL pairs. Finally, the resolver indexes those pairs. Then the resolver can respond to API queries requesting a URL for a specified GUID. That URL may be hosted by the owning collection or the specified cache. In all cases, the choice to expose all or portions of a record is made by local specified administrators. The broker then retrieves data from many different providers. Currently, we have Specify's public copy of the local record, aggregator copies from GBIF and IDIC Bio, 3D image data and metadata cataloged in Morphosource, taxonomic information from IDIS, WORMS, and GBIF, and actual and predicted distribution maps from LifeMapper, GBIF, and IDIC Bio. With retrieved data, it handles network errors, standardizes outputs, identifies inconsistencies, and allows direct comparison between the values and annotations of providers and aggregators with the source data in Specify. The user interface between Specify and the Specify network is displayed in a browser tab. The page displays the local and linked data values for a single collection object. In the top of the page here, we can see data quality issues reported by GBIF and IDIC Bio. Scrolling down the page, we can compare values in various Darwin Core fields in the source data and the GBIF and IDIC bio interpretations of that data. 
rows printed in red indicate that the values don't match. This may happen for a variety of reasons. In some cases, the aggregator might update a location, for example, adding a negative sign or filling in the country code to match the coordinates. In other cases, aggregators may enforce a controlled vocabulary or format a date. Scrolling further down, we can examine taxonomy values from various name authorities. Links at the top of the column will take you directly to the provider's webpage for this taxonomic name. And finally, at the bottom of this page, we have a map of the species occurrences held in GBIF and IDBio. If this were a terrestrial species modeled by LifeMapper, the map would include a predicted distribution layer. Our next push is to link computational products from Biotify into Specify 7. Here's a scatter plot created by Biotify of specimens of red maple, a common North American tree species. Biotify examines all the specimen records for a particular species and plots them in scatter plots that encompass various dimensions of climate space. This example pairs the axes of annual mean precipitation with annual mean temperature. Then the ellipses represent standards of deviation one, two, and three. GBIF points are in blue, and this collection's points are in green. You can see that the collection's points are mostly within one standard deviation of the mean of these two variables. Outliers may represent errors in recording or misidentifications, organisms cultivated outside of their range, or true range extensions. So we can use analyses like these for climate and for other dimensions of specimen data to characterize what any particular specimen or collection contributes to the known information about a species. Here's another example of a climate space analysis that represents a new integration that we're working on with the Cold Spring Harbor DNA Learning Labs. Cold Spring Harbor has an extensive network of teachers and researchers who hold workshops and summer courses for high school students on the uses of DNA for research. One of their curricula has the students forage for ants in the New York City area and then preserve and sequence them for the CO2 gene. They then use the BOLD database to identify the species based on previously identified DNA samples. They want to show the students the impact of their collections on scientific knowledge about the species and enable them to make contributions using their own samples. So here we can illustrate to the students how their, how their points fit into different environmental dimensions compared to known occurrences. Future work on the specified network will include expanding the data types and providers accessible through the broker, speeding up queries and analyses through additional virtualizing, containerizing, and parallelizing, and connecting Biotify analysis tools for a comparative analysis of individual records, species, and collections alone and within the context of data from the larger community. The Specify Network joins the community effort towards a digital object architecture by leveraging our established KU informatics projects and combining the computational power and software infrastructure of LifeMapper and Biotify with the established platform of Specify and its global user footprint, bringing a web of biological information within reach of our users. The digital object architecture for specimens is going to require a host of new standards, protocols, and application interfaces. The Specify network will engage with the community to define and implement standards and tools to move this vision forward. Special thanks to the National Science Foundation for funding these activities through the CIBR program and grant number 1930005. Thanks very much. Have a good conference. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. Amy is also here live to answer any questions. I do not see any posed, though, in the chat. So, uh, I will invite our next presenter, Sarah Davidson. Sarah is the curator with MoveBank, which is in the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior. Welcome, Sarah. All right, can you hear me and see the screen, see the slide? Yes, we can, thank you.
All right, great. Okay, I think I should. I was just asked to unmute again. That might have been for the uh, the other um, application. So if, send a note in the chat if anybody can't hear me. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Ben and James for the invitation to be part of the symposium today and all the other speakers. This has been really interesting uh, for me as well. So I, again, I'm the I'm the curator for MoveBank at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior, and I'm not an API expert myself. I don't develop them, but I do use and document them. And so today, I'll provide a kind of a use case of how we use APIs to move biologging data in and out of the MoveBank database. Okay, now I'm having the. There we go. Um, for some context, I'll define biologging data here as data collected by sensors on animals. And often when people talk about biologging data, they're talking about animal tracking, so the tracking of individual animals. MoveBank is a global database for biologging and animal tracking data. And it's a set of tools and services for working with data throughout their life cycle. So APIs are supporting many of the, uh, these movements of data in and out of the core database that you see in this diagram. So I'll be walking you through this. Again, um, this is a really global database. Each dot here represents a single study or project um, with colored based on access for the public to that project. Um, we just reached 3 billion locations here on MoveBank. These are describing movements of over 1,100 species. These are stored in 6,600 studies that are created and managed by 3,100 different data owners. So a bit on the scope and design of the data model and database. So first, users create studies and then they add and manage data within those studies. And then we're storing animal Observate basically animal occurrences, relocations, and sensor measurements from those animal born sensors. So, in this example, we have GPS fixes uh, the southward migration of a great egret, along with acceleration, three dimensional acceleration data collected coincidentally with those uh, GPS locations. And then users relate. Um, the tag data, the sensor data to animals through deployments. And so by having places to describe animals, tags, and deployments, that allows you to capture things like the capture event deployment methods and the fate of the animal. So every data value here is harmonized using a shared data model and vocabulary. A link to the vocabulary that's, that's published also has its own APIs uh, is at the bottom of the slide there. And then lastly, the other important thing to know is that users control access to the data. So it can be either public or they can control access to just other users that they give various permissions to, to access the data. And so from here, I'll illustrate uses of the API and we'll start with data import. So we have worked with um, biologging data providers to develop custom automated uh, data transfer and import protocols. So this allows users to go into MoveBank, create a study, and then subscribe to have data for actively deployed tags transmitted automatically to, into their study in MoveBank. And then we've worked with the uh, providers to make sure that that's all imported according to our vocabulary and, um, you know, trend converting units, formats, um, time zones, et cetera, so that everything is standardized as it, as it comes in. We also have an animal tagger app. So this allows researchers to capture information about um, their captures and, and deployments of these tags in the field. And then they can go back on, on while they are, when they are back online, they can edit or add more information and then they can push and transfer that um, information to their study in MoveBank. And so most of the way people use APIs with MoveBank is to pull data. So here we have the Animal Tracker mobile app. This allows the public and researchers in the field to follow current movements of animals carrying these tags that are using automated feeds so that they're updating um, one or multiple times per day. 
And then we have a publicly documented REST API. You'll see in the upper right, I'll use that little unlock key to um, identify those where we do have public documentation. So this is the what gets the most use. Um, this returns data as CSV, so tabular text. This is what most of our users want. And then users can develop applications that rely on MoveBank's harmonized format, the APIs plus access permissions to build their own um, to build their own tools or make analysis methods available to others. So there's a couple of popular um, R packages that allow users to go ahead and um, log into MoveBank access data, and then the package already knows how to read the data because they're in this harmonized format. We have recently had our beta release of a new analysis platform called Move Apps. So this allows users to create repeatable analysis workflows by connecting sequences of user contributed analysis modules or apps. And so all of these workflows begin by accessing animal tracking data from MoveBank, um, seeing a list of what is available to them and then choosing what they wanna bring into um, Move Apps to work with. We also allow, um, we have a documentation for um, requesting JSON data, data in JSON format. And so this is most commonly used to, for, by users to build uh, live updating maps on their own websites. So, you know, within the scope, within the context of their own project or, or research, um, uh, research groups websites. We also offer a service called EnvData or the Environmental Data Automated Track Annotation System. This allows users to link animal occurrences and related records to 850 environmental variables from 80 global remote sensing and um, weather reanalysis products. And so we offer APIs to automate these requests for annotation. And then we also are, uh, just as a note, we're relying on a lot of APIs to access these data automatically from providers once we receive a request. Um, right in the we're in the test phase right now of a new REST API that um, reduces data volume. So the idea here is um, to enable larger projects, they don't necessarily need the gigabytes of acceleration data, they, and they may not need every millisecond of some of the higher um, resolution, resolution uh, GPS um, duty cycles, and so they can they can re return location data only lim uh, that is limited as specified through data reduction profiles. So in this example here, um, it allow you will reduce what you receive to at least twenty four hours between consecutive events. So here I'm requesting daily data per animal. Um, so this um, reduced a data API was developed for the Eurasian African bird migration atlas. And so this is an example of how we're working to scale up this kind of project-based um, database. And so we're currently supporting three separate projects that are each bringing together hemispheric scale bird migration data for uh, migratory bird atlases, dynamic mapping and conservation tools, and in each case, they're using MoveBank and our APIs as a data discovery and acquisition portal. So a few challenges um, that I wanted to just uh, kind of talk about what we're through our experience. So the APIs are supporting faster and more automated access to larger amounts of data, which is super great. And you can see kind of some of what that's enabling. Um, I would say, a few things that we've identified as, as challenges to moving forward. One is uh, the biologging community. Um, they're having their symposium also this week. Um, we do not have standards and there's lots of reasons for, for this, but the, the data that are delivered by many, many different biologging companies are not standardized in any way. So when it's an incredible effort to build and maintain each of these individual links um, to offer this type of automated data feed. And that's really limiting for us, but as well as for anybody else who wants to be um, doing research using, multi using equipment for multiple companies or other platforms that may wanna build these type of tools. 
We also, I would say, um, tools for supporting and a proper interpretation and use of the data. So if you go to our website, you're going to see maps that, and you can look at the map and see that there's outliers that have not been flagged in the data set. You can look at our documentation that will explain the data, push a button to contact the data owner, and all these things make it easier to identify quality issues and understand the context in which the data were collected. Now, APIs allow access without any of this context and often for people who are not familiar with biologging data methods. And so this can lead to misunderstandings in interpreting and using the data. Uh, another one is expectations. And so um, owners of public data, they often maybe make their data public after publishing a paper, but it's part of their full you know, research effort. They're still actively using the data and they really wanna collaborate and be able to report on the use of their data, even if they may have a CC license on that data set. And we have citation guidelines and a data policy that try and kind of communicate that to people. Um, but accessing data through API makes it harder for us to direct people to this documentation and help to grow um, a kind of a culture of, you know, how do we share data? How do we use other people's data? Um, I would say also, you know, with publishers and journals, this is also a struggle right now. There's not even really a good method to cite even tens of data sets in a research paper. And so as these kind of larger scale projects grow, um, I think that we have a lack of, of ways either through you know, peer reviewed journals and, and in our platforms of how do we make sure we're communicating um, how we expect the data to be used and, and attributed. And then lastly, um, links to organism data across platforms. So we have data in MoveBank for animals that also have data in GenBank. And right now, if you go and read the paper, you will kind of get those links and be able to find them. But um, to be able to discover data across platforms or identify duplicated data. Um, I know GBIF has been talking about as well. And so I am hoping that a problem like this is exactly uh, part of the impetus for the digital extended specimen effort. Um, and so we are looking forward to, to seeing how that moves forward. And that's all I have today. Uh, thank you for your time. And um, I'm here for questions and my contact information is also at the bottom of the slide. Thank you so much, so much, Sarah. We do have a few questions and I realize we're going to go over time, but there's 30 minutes built in and I'd um, like to capture your answers for the recording that will be available later. Okay. So uh, very quickly, um, can, is there a, a data dump and can someone download it um, of all the open data centers for a big science project? So, so can they do a, a large data dump of all the sensor data? Right. So. No, there you can you can um, you could build you can build um, scripts with the API to identify publicly available data, and then you know you can go and collect those um, individually. Part of the problem is we want to make sure that people are getting back to the the source information. There's also because users um, create and manage their own studies, they're often co collect. Some of these public data are being collected. Uh, right now, they're coming in right now, and sometimes they have outliers in them, or sometimes the animal may have died and the user hasn't yet, um, you know, figured that out and then gone and put an end date to stop associating the uh, the data with an animal because the animal's dead or the animal may have been carried off to the house of a hunter. And so all this this stuff is kind of live updating information. And so, I mean, the reason we haven't done this like oh let's put it at a data dump kind of level i mean we're moving there i think we're kind of getting there how do we how do we um but again like with the challenges i listed how do i tell you when you do your data dump here's the kinds of things you need to be looking for i have a place to i have a page for that on our website um but how do i make sure you see that um and with a with a website i can make you click yes i understand this um but i can't with the api so these um are the kinds of things we're working on, on resolving, but yeah, the short answer is no, we don't have a data dump of all public data. This is also, um, as far as trust building with the researchers who use MoveBank, 
they t often do not are not really keen on having their data used like that without um, without kind of they want their citation to be coming with those data and so so it's kind of a, a building uh, trust building community building and um, kind of gaining experience with the benefits of something like a data dump what could that how could that benefit uh, the data owner um, and so those are all kind of things we're working on in parallel. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I know you you discuss the need for standards a bit. There's a, a question specifically about, um, do you have standards to describe the sensors, uh, for instance, device name, ID, and model? Yes, so if you go look at the published vocabulary, we have um, attributes, data attributes that describe um, tags, sensors, deployments, animals, and events. And so, yes, we have exactly those types of um, variables for, for tags. Perfect. Um, are the 850 environmental layers documented somewhere? Yes. So if you go into MoveBank, there's a GUI where it walks you through. Um, you can query, you can kind of look through them either by data provider or by um, type. So for people who don't know what MODIS is, they can go in and say, well, I want vegetation. Show me what you have for vegetation at different um, resolutions. And uh, I do have, a, I, I can send you, if you email me, the underlying table, uh, which that GUI is built on. Awesome. Okay. And could we use Wikidata to link and maintain different identifiers of individual organisms? Um, that's a good question. I would like to hear if we could do that. Um, I would say like sometimes the same organism may be in multiple studies in MoveBank or they might be in MoveBank and they might also be in another um, biologging database. And so I think that I'm not, I'm not sure where the limit lies of what, um, what can be done automatically and what requires you know, the managers of these different platforms and the data owners to be participating and identifying what really truly is a, an individual organism. Um, and another one, um, it says, are you, are you proving algorithms to detect behaviors? I'm wondering if it's providing. Does that make more sense? Yeah, so I'm um, detecting behaviors and segmenting behaviors. So detecting, you know, separating out migration events from um, wintering, non-wintering, you know, stationary events as an example. Sure, so people are actively developing those type of methods. Um, and that's really was kind of the motivation for developing the Move Apps analysis platform is that MoveBank is not gonna be in charge of, of developing or, or, or identifying what is the best possible method. But with this application, um, whoever has built the state-of-the-art method for doing that can you know, contribute an app um, within that, that um, software to then run that segmentation. Um, Considering MoveBank has a really wide, some I have seen tools, maybe something like that, that you could implement in as some kind of automated fashion um, within a database. I think that gets a lot harder when you have really diverse taxonomic um, representation. I'm sure Jeeva, you know, could uh, folks could speak to that as well. But you know how you would do that for for a bird um, or for a, an ungulate might be completely might be quite different um, and. And, and for also for different types of data, really different resolutions and quality. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. <clears throat> Thank you. And our next presenter is from GBIF, Matthew Blissett. Hello, um, I'm uh, Matthew Blissett, a software developer at the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. I'm going to present an overview of the GBIF infrastructure and APIs um, and give some insight into the lessons learned while operating and evolving the systems. So GBIF is a global data infrastructure that integrates data from more than 1,700 institutions. These institutions publish over 62,000 data sets, totaling almost 2 billion records of species occurrence, presence or absence worldwide. Each of the 62,000 data sets is checked for updates at least weekly, as well as on demand by the publisher. The growth in occurrence data in recent years averages to over 800,000 new records added each day. So users can access GBIF through the gbif.org website 
all through open APIs that adhere to the data standards provided by Tadwick. The APIs allow for data to be accessed in a structured machine readable format suitable for running analysis workflows, embedding into web, uh, other websites, smartphone apps, and so on. For most access, there's no registration or user account required. So how does the data get into GBIF's index? Um, at the core is this GBIF registry. Most GBIF systems integrate with the registry in some way. Uh, it manages the organizations, the institutions, the data sets, and the users that are part of GBIF network. And it provides a RESTful API for managing, querying, and updating its data. Systems, external systems like Living Atlases, Specify EarthCape, and the GBIF IPT use the registry API to create data sets or notify the registry of updates. A huge help for those integrating their systems with the registry is our public test system on gbif-uat.org. It's a completely independent copy of all GBIF's APIs, services, and the website, though with only a subset of the data. The full process of registering a data set and seeing the results can be tested. It's really useful for software developers and data managers who can experiment with the system without worrying about corrupting their real data. And it's also where we at GBIF test new features and get feedback before putting the changes on gbif.org. So changes in the registry trigger data crawling. This is the process where data is retrieved from the publisher's systems and stored on ours. The previous design for this crawling and processing system made heavy use of messaging systems. Datasets were split into individual occurrence records, which were sent as messages to be interpreted using our data quality processes and then indexed. This was good for running data processing in parallel, but these individual messages meant we lost the view of a dataset as a whole, and they gave us performance problems when we transferred or when we processed the largest datasets. Where a published dataset included duplicate or corrupt records, it also was more difficult to spot outside the context of a complete dataset. So we need to, to replace this one by one approach with a whole data set processor. And this is the pipeline system. The pipeline system takes a complete data set and organizes it and enriches it using reference catalogs accessed through open APIs, such as our vocabulary server and our taxonomic backbone. Using Apache Beam and Spark, we can now reprocess and re-index all of GBIF's 2 billion data occurrences in under two days. And this used to take over a week on about half, the, half as much data. So here's an example of a reference catalog, the GBIF backbone, uh, which organ, uh, occurrences are aligned to. The name matching service is a public API and it returns a consistent interpretation of the published name to be used in the index. And there's an example on the left of the query showing the, uh, the incorrect data and the consistent response that comes back. Another case is the vocabularies. The vocabularies are sets of concepts for a Darwin core term. Uh, for example, for this life stage vocabulary, um, there's adult, juvenile, sub-adult, and so on. Part of the processing is to align the various ways to write adult, so like spelling mistakes or different languages, so to a single value so that you can aid searching. We're used to manage the interpretation and alignment of vocabularies using an open source Java library on GitHub. Of course, that's another type of API. However, this wasn't very visible or accessible to the people who best understood the vocabularies, and changes could be quite slow to work their way into production. We're replacing that with a new vocabulary API and an associated user interface. So coupled with the improved speed at which we can reinterpret some or all data sets, it's enabling us to improve data quality. For example, we can quickly add extra synonyms to one of these terms and then reprocess the affected data sets. Uh, APIs like this are also suitable for improving data quality using tools like R, Python, or OpenRefine. Um, and they could be integrated into uh, collection management systems directly. The data access APIs provide search and download services. Um, asynchronous APIs are required for large downloads, and those you also need to register for. Um, but users do find this, more, this asynchronous API more difficult to use, and they seem to prefer the synchronous API wherever that's possible. From our experience, uh, long-term stability is essential for the widespread adoption we've seen with this API. 
Uh, we know of clients started by the community in R and Python, um, and there's community training materials using OpenRefine. And we can see hundreds of other systems accessing these APIs every day. Um, there's many websites, too many to count, that uh, embed GBIF data using these APIs. Most commonly, they're using the maps. Um, but we can see collection systems online also accessing data on their own collection or related collections. Um, our general policy since 2014, when version one of this API was released, is to add to the API, but not to remove from it. So we might add additional endpoints, additional parameters, additional properties or vocabulary values. Um, and we need to do this to follow updates to the Darwin core standard. Um, where possible, the new API is backward compatible with the old one. And that's, that is even to the point of incompatibility with Darwin core. So for example, we've kept the basis of record literature um, as we still have older data sets using this value and it was previously part of the standard. Um, we try and announce any changes on the mailing list um, and on the, the release notes on the website. Um, it's worth mentioning the experimental data clustering feature is a, a new feature, uh, a new API. This uses traditional and machine learning algorithms to find close to, closely related occurrences in the GBIF index. For example, where samples of the same specimen um, are in mul multiple museum collections or when a specimen has later had its DNA sequenced by maybe a different organization. By using this experimental API, a collection management system could find data quality issues, um, such as where the uh, GBIF has detected something uh, linked, linked data that's got different values for some of the fields, or it could augment local records with details present on a duplicate or a different collection or show sequences and so on. I see my presentation, here we go, that's better. Um, so far, all the APIs I've mentioned have been RESTful um, and many other presenters have covered what that is. That designs usually with a single object and it works really well for managing those. However, some of our objects are very, very large and especially when searching that can give responses approaching megabytes of data. So modern websites are making increased use of the web browser directly accessing these APIs. And it's becoming important for the API to make increased, uh, more efficient use of the available bandwidth. So we're currently adopting GraphQL. Um, we're trialing this only on our hosted portals. Uh, Gbif.us is an example, the easiest one to say out loud, to enable this next generation. Um, we're going to then look at perhaps using it on Gbif.org. So GraphQL runs in front of our existing APIs and it provides a more structured model of the data. Um, a single GraphQL query could cause several backend API queries, maybe to the occurrences, registry, and checklists. But then instead of returning all of the data, it only returns what's asked of it. So this query, for example, of, uh, of just an occurrence record, instead of returning 339 fields, it's only returning the scientific name and the title. Um, but the title is from the data set, and that would otherwise require an additional query to the registry API. Um, so in other words, uh, it, it makes it more efficient. Only what's required has been returned um, and only a single request has been made from the web browser. Um, we're using GraphQL as that's a standard community driven approach for this. Um, before we could have done this, but it would have meant adding additional REST endpoints, which is something we tried to avoid. Potentially GraphQL can also bridge out to external APIs. So we're trying, we're, we've got this for Wikidata um, although it's not yet something we're fully relying on. Um, and also we need to look, be careful about the performance of these queries there, potentially because one query can make several or even tens of several uh, backend queries. Um, it's something to watch out for load on our existing APIs, though I think GraphQL does have something to uh, work with this. Documentation. Uh, so. Some of the documentation is on the Wikipedia website. It's mostly up to date, uh, but it's a bit incomplete. It lists the queries and the parameters, but not so much the response objects. And I think some of the other speakers who've shown the documentation systems that they've been using, even the ones that uh, 
embed examples, including making an example query and receiving the example response, um, this looks much better and it's much more user friendly. So we'll be looking into a tool uh, to replace uh, this documentation system. Thank you. Um, if there's any questions, I'll take some questions. Um, but I might ask my colleagues, especially Morton, who's the main uh, work behind GraphQL, um, since uh, I don't know much about it. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. We do have a couple of questions specifically for you. And then we also have one uh, more general question for all our presenters. Um, can you elaborate on asynchronous APIs and why they are less used, for instance, for large data downloads? Um, with a, well, so at the moment, if you make a query, you can return up to 200,000 records synchronously. I think this is easy to use because it works like every other REST API. You, you make a query and you immediately get back the data. And uh, people who are used to writing scripts around these APIs, they don't mind writing a loop to loop through and make many, many requests for each successive page of data. Uh, the using the asynchronous download API, you make a request, you get back your download key from GBIF, and you have to keep asking. You just keep asking it every minute, say, has my download finished? And implementing this logic is a little bit more difficult for people who aren't used to programming. Uh, for, the, for the developers, for the developers, it's fine. For, for um, some of the more casual users of the API, it's a little trickier to do that but the downloads can take from 15 minutes to sometimes an hour or so to complete. So there's not really an alternative for that. And in the end, it is almost always quicker than using the page by page API. Thank you. Another from your experience, what is the most important in API design to ensure ease of maintenance, future proof or backward compatibility? Uh, that's tricky. I didn't design the API at GBIF. I've inherited a very well-designed API. Um, it's, hmm. Tim, do you want to say something to that? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, it's an interesting question. Backwards compatibility is really important for us because so many people use the GBIF API and that does limit our ability to, to bring in new features. It's also been the reason why GBIF has deviated sometimes from Tadwick standards like um, Darwin Core. Um, yeah, we, yeah, I, I think that's about <clears throat> all I can say on it really. Yeah, try and design it to be future-proof, but you don't really know the future, do you? So just follow the current best practices and hopefully that will work out. It seems to have worked out in 20, 2009 to 2014 when API version one was being designed. Thank you. Uh, I know that we do have a version two for maps, um, but because um, so many people embed version one maps. We've made a, we've uh, version one maps API still exists. It's rooted currently through the version two, but you know the users don't see that. But we'll maintain both, and I think there's no reason not to continue maintaining both indefinitely. Thank you. And how do you monitor the usage of the API? Um, we don't basically. Uh, we have some logs. We only keep the logs for about a week because there's so much data um, by so many requests, um, partly because we're using it internally very extensively. Um, so we, we can make uh, small snapshots of a week. That's how I could say that we have hundreds of websites and hundreds of users each day using it, um, but we're not doing any, currently not doing any long-term long monitoring. We're looking into this. We have had a request to do so. Um, from the data publishers to see how their data is being used. Um, downloads, where they make a persistent object each download. So those are, they're all recorded, they're all on the GPIF website. Um, and each one has a DOI. Um, so we track the citation there and 
generally, I think that's a that's a better way of monitoring the data use. There's a real thing. Someone's maybe published some data, made a citation. It's a bit difficult to count use of an API because one download might have much more scientific value than 500,000 requests that could have been done by one download. Someone put, uh, we have a question for Sarah, actually, um, but it refers to GBIF. So Sarah, do you think sharing MoveBank data to GBIF and using the literature tracking they do could be an option for providing the attribution data providers are looking for? It only works with downloads though. So still the same issue with the API making attribution difficult. Yeah. Um, well, we do have, I can post a link somewhere. Um, we have a project um, funded by the Dutch GBIF. We're going to be um, developing a protocol for, for moving public data, the published um, data to MoveBank, which is a small subset of all the data in MoveBank, but we're going to kind of start looking at this protocol. What would it look like? And we're going to publish, um, convert it to Darwin Core and publish it to uh, GBIF um, over the next year. So that'll be a nice kind of case study to look at. Yeah, I don't know that it solves. I mean, first off, there's lots. I would say that the most common use case in MoveBank is the researchers at, at this stage, right? So I'm also trying to think ahead, what is this gonna look like in 20 years when these people have retired, right? But um, at this stage, the most common um, owner, data owner in MoveBank is actively collecting their data, using it, doing collaborations with different people. They're sharing it, they're bringing in the data as they're collecting it. And um, it's, it's, shared by you know by by request only essentially with with specific other users um and there's public discoverability on MoveBank so people can find it and contact them um and so that kind of stuff as i understand it couldn't go to gbif um at the like it's not in an archive format really at this point right it's it's still like a it's the equivalent of you know your your pro your project database on your computer but people are using a shared platform for that kind of draft working working uh, data set. And uh, so that is a lot of what's in MoveBank and that wouldn't make sense uh, to, to put in GBIF, I don't think. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, so within MoveBank, we have citation guidelines. We have, and I've, I've looked at, you know, I've, I've read a lot of the GBIF documentation. It's been really helpful in kind of figuring out our policy and how we want to frame things. And so it's been a really great, um, you know, kind of best use, um, kind of case to, uh, for us to, to have. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, have, we have that stuff and we have users can say how they want their data to be cited. Um, and I have a bunch of kind of things in the works to kind of improve, kind of make things more consistent, more complete. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure that moving it to GBIF would solve that specific problem. Thank you, Sarah. We have a general question for all the speakers. What experiences have you had with API gateways, positive and negative, in managing issues in relation to user agreements, usage, and downstream attribution, et cetera? Would any of the presenters like to uh, answer? Sorry, I was muted. Um, oh. GBIF doesn't particularly have any gateway or restrictions on the API other than the download API. Um, but it's only the downloads where we request, well, sorry, we request attribution for everything. Um, but I think it's only the downloads where we can actually track that uh, properly. I don't really, so yeah, I can't answer the question because we don't do any uh, gateways and so on. Um, but that's another approach, right? Just to have it free and easy, um, that gives maximum usage, the fewest barriers, um, and uh, hope for the best by encouragement, just on the documentation, on the citation page, how to cite the GBIF. Um, we don't, I've, I've used other APIs and I, I won't name them, but I, I find it a little odd when every day or two I'm asked, are you going to cite this data? Please remember to cite this data. What are you using it for? Uh, I know it's open data and if I need the data, I'll still click through, but uh, I find that a bit annoying. 
Yeah, so maybe if I can just respond as well is that, um, you know, my feeling about building APIs is that you're building them to make your data openly accessible and, um, and you're trying to encourage people to use your systems. And, and I've experienced it where people, you know, when people start exploring this idea of building APIs, they, they still have this feeling of trying to, you know, trying to regulate things and hold on to things and, you know, that kind of thing. So like they want to manually... Uh, um, you know, you might have examples where people may want to manually approve every person who's going to use their API. So you have to register to use the API and someone's going to look in the background and say, yeah, okay, cool. Do I know this guy? Do I like him? He can use my API or not kind of thing. And, um, and then, you know, if like, I don't even think there's a point in having an API if that's the route you're going to go. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I can offer in that regard. And regarding the, the tracking people, it, one of the major problems, in, the, in the, especially the private sector and a lot of APIs with sensitive information is security. Although I get the security bulletins every day and a lot of the security vulnerabilities and in, in the recent um, hacks have come through a company's API. They don't quite understand them and they leave vulnerabilities in the URL and so forth. And uh, hackers have taken um, advantage of this and sort of broken. Fortunately for us, we don't really have that issue. And, and that's very thankful because the amount of resources it takes to secure things can sometimes dwarf everything else. And so um, the only other thing is that when you track people, I started that, is that you're concerned that somebody's going to hit your API too much. Um, now I'm sure GPF has this issue, you know, and so does NASA especially has this problem um, that you just get overwhelmed. And so you have to, at some point, track the users and then you can throttle, it's called throttling. You can throttle the net and um, I now just does this too. You can throttle the number of requests per day just to make sure it doesn't get overwhelmed. And so it's just a necessary, you try to minimize as much as possible, but sometimes you have to put those things in to, um, to just basically keep your system running. I, I don't have that issue, but I think Jeep does, some of the larger ones certainly do. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's necessary. Yeah, I have seen this a little bit also with the, the EMF data. So I'm we're dealing with all these API, APIs from NASA and, and all these other um, big data providers. And they've all, as I've seen, moved in the past several years to like, you do need to register to use the API and you have to give a reason for use at at least one point. Um, I think for that reason, for people who are um, misusing the API or, you know, per, hurting, harming their performance. Um, and then also uh, these people all need to get funding for their work, right? And so being able to uh, get some information about how the data are being used and be able to contact the people using the data um, is another um, way that they can show that it was worthwhile to, to publish their data somewhere with an API. So um, that's another kind of reason for keeping tabs somehow on, on who's using it is to make sure they're able to take credit for that use when applying for funding. And I, I suspect that's a major reason why the these um, remote sensing data providers have implemented, um, I would say very slightly more restrictive, um, you know, protocols for getting data from them. I will say that the question of how are you gonna use this data is sometimes it's, you wanna ask as few questions as possible out of the user. And I, I have a feeling that 80% of the, or the answers are just putting something in there. <laughs> they might as well be my grandmother. You know what I mean? I mean, people just, I mean, they may not, a lot of people just don't know, right? They're just exploring things and they don't know. And sometimes one of those questions that, unless you really need to, for some reason, like you've got to document it for some grant or something, that just isn't really necessary. Mm -hmm. try to minimize yeah. those things. I mean, I think part of the problem with the, the, yeah, just asking once is right. I'm going to go in there first and I'm just messing around. I just want to see what this looks like. And then later when I actually published a paper with it, I didn't necessarily go back in and like update my resp <laughs> response to you. So I, yeah, there's some, it's not um, ideal. Uh, yeah, I, I have not figured out like a good solution. Tim. We do have Thanks. one last question for- but Tim has his hand raised. Oh, oh so sorry, Tim. Sorry, Noreen. Um, yeah, it's just, just in sort of response to that, at, at Jeep, if we try not to just measure um, clicks of or requests on APIs or clicks on the websites uh, and try and identify real scientific use of data. So, so we focused on um, 
like Matt said, the, the downloaded data and citations. And pe people may not know this, but someone at GVIF at the Secretariat actually reads papers every day and he codifies them and he, he sort of uh, classifies them into the topic and how GVIF was used. And then we compile the science review every year based on his work and codifying all of that. So we actually actively monitor um, how GBIF data are used by reading the, the resulting papers. And we're, we're approaching four papers per day citing GBIF mediated data. So that's becoming more work for, for him. Do you guys log the number of requests per user, logged in user? Possibly, I can't, I'm not aware we would use it though. No, I don't think we, well, there's the IP address in the web server logs, but those right. logs are huge. We delete them after a few days. Yeah, We, we, just, we uh, monitor generally by country, actually, because we're multi-governmental, we're interested in how people within countries are using um, the infrastructure. Point. And uh, for Matthew and Tim, are you starting to see value standardization in data sets through the use of the vocabulary server, i.e. are the value standardization steps promoting standardization at source? You may as well answer this, Tim. You already answered it, I saw. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh. a, it's a fair question. Um, I would describe this work as relatively in its infancy. So I would say at this point, probably not. I think there is quite a lot of interest in it. And Nikki's response is perfectly um, valid. But no, I would say at this point, uh, we're not seeing um, great value at, um, at source. We did have, when I, I looked at the, the Java code that we used to, well, that this is replacing the, the old Java GBIF parsers library, um, there were a few users, not, not very many, but uh, and it is a little difficult to track because the code is on GitHub and can't always track what people are doing. But um, there were maybe five to 10 software systems that occasionally requested that Java library from our server. So this had been embedded, um, but they were using a mixture of old versions, recent versions, all kinds. So, uh, and it was difficult to know what they were because all I knew is that someone's Java software was downloading this during its compilation. It could have been a test project, it could be someone's huge website. I don't know. I, I'm one of them, by the way. Okay, nice. <laughs> I tried to set up some standardized value API, so I'm one of the 10 that scrubbed their stuff. We are um, definitely at time, and we have answered all of the questions that have been directed to chat. So I want to, um, just for myself, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to all our presenters. And Ben Norton would also like to offer a few um, parting words. Thanks, Ben. Just, just a, a thank you um, for everybody for attending early this, I guess some of this early this morning. I, I really appreciate it. Um, we put a lot of work in making the symposium really good and, and diverse topics. and initiate. So sometimes it's hard to get questions at 7 a.m. So I'm glad people, I really appreciate people asking questions. So that, that's about it. Thank you so much.